The great games just do not stop coming. Seriously, I still have some pretty major games from 2017 on the backlog. I missed a few big releases from this past year too, and there are still several games from years prior that I want to try. But that's enough about what I haven't played, and more on to the subject of the video. 2018 was stacked with great games, both just in general, and I finally got around to playing some games that I've been meaning to for at least a couple years. So I'm gonna count down my 10 favorites. Alright, so before I jump into this one, I feel inclined to inform you of a couple things in the event that you don't already know. One, this game is free. Two, it's only a couple of hours, and three, the less you know about it while you play it, the better. Anyway, Doki Doki Literature Club surprised me. No, not because I didn't know it was like a dating simulator with a sinister twist, but it surprised me because it actually got me invested. The characters, with the exception of maybe one, filled archetypes that you would expect them to, but they were done in a way that managed to keep me interested in the scene-by-scene -scene goings on of the game. And then by the time everything started getting serious, the game had its hooks in me enough to actually provoke some level of emotion out of me. So, given that I was not expecting a whole lot from it, and it was only a couple hours of investment, by the time I got to the end of this I enjoyed it quite a bit, and it's safe to say that I'm pretty happy I didn't judge this book by its cover. You know, in 2018, it's pretty amusing to play a single-player 2D platformer that was published by EA. Granted, Unravel was released in 2016, but you get my point. This game is a labor of love, and it shows the entire way through. You take control of Yarny, this super endearing yarn doll that's going to explore to his heart's content, and there's not an evil bird or rodent that's going to stop him. Unravel focuses a bit more on the puzzling and physics than it does the super intense platforming, so I was able to take my time and relax and enjoy the sweet backdrops to the levels. The peaceful and scenic backgrounds paired excellently with the serene music to compound this really great feeling of relaxation. The levels themselves were also paced really well. Whenever I was starting to feel as if one level was about to overstay its welcome, I usually reached the end of the level in about a screen or two after that. Overall, Unravel manages to knit together a lovely experience that I can see myself revisiting a time or two. Oh man, a game that looks like Lone Survivor? Take my money! I'll say that the main difference between Claire and Lone Survivor is that this game's story isn't as vague and there's no combat. The game has you take control of Claire, a lady who is looking after her mother in a hospital. That is, until things get spooky. Soon enough, Claire is wandering around all sorts of unnerving environments while being chased down by shadow creatures that, as I mentioned before, you can't fight and you just have to run away from. The retro visuals pair nicely with the sound design to create an intriguing atmosphere that will put you on edge as you're exploring the various areas of the game. Add on a sympathetic protagonist and a few different choices that affect your ending in some capacity, and a story that drip feeds you bits of her past to contextualize the events that are happening, and you've got a pretty solid way to kill a couple of hours. It's not very often that I'm interested in a first-person shooter. The biggest exception in recent memory that I can think of is when I played Bioshock a couple of years ago. So imagine my surprise when, seeing footage for Doom for the first time, I was interested from the start. It takes the book of the modern first-person shooter, sets it on fire, and scatters the ashes to the wind. Screw hiding behind cover to get some health back. I'm gonna squeeze my HP recovery from the eye sockets and skulls of all of these silly demons. Seriously though, the glory kills are some of my favorite things about this game. With a couple of exceptions, they are quick but really snazzy ways to finish off enemies, and the enemy lineup is varied enough that I never felt like I was seeing too much of the same animation too often. There's also no shortage of weapons, and they're a lot of fun to use. I mostly just stuck to the shotgun and the double-barreled shotgun, but I would cycle through some of the other weapons when I was feeling adventurous. The game is also littered with an abundance of upgrades and challenges to do if you so desire, as well as logs that detail the lore of the game and by extension most of the story, but it can be summarized and basically, Doom Guy woke up and now he's angry. One of my favorite things that I discovered was that Doom Guy in this game is like this mythic demon slayer bully man for the minions of evil, and it's just awesome. I think the best way to describe Doom would be to say that it is an adrenaline injection that knows exactly what it wants to be and achieves it in the most satisfying way. Ah, 
Ah yes, we go from the adrenaline-fueled rampage that is Doom to something that is hilariously mundane. Seriously, Valhalla feels like a sub-area from a different game that your character would just constantly be returning to in order to take a break from the main story, and the world it exists in is rather intriguing. You take on the role of Jill, one of the bartenders at the soon-to-be-closing bar, Valhalla. What makes the game so interesting is the number of fascinating patrons that come into the bar. This ranges from self-important news editors, to androids, to ladies with cat ears, to a brain in a jar. Most of these encounters were rather enjoyable, and the fact that some of these things are just allowed to exist with very little explanation of the how or why actually helped me with just accepting the world that was being presented to me. Not to mention Jill and her co-workers are all pretty cool and likable as well. Jill's boss Dana is super nice and kind of wacky. Gil has a checkered and mysterious past, and any time it's even kind of brought up, he gets hilariously defensive about it. And Jill, more often than not, plays the straight man to the antics that are happening around her, but she isn't above being the perpetrator of the antics herself sometimes. She even has a solid bit of character development by the end of the game, and I wasn't really expecting that given how the first couple of hours were going, but there was a part of her arc that resonated with me in a way that caught me off guard. The music in the game is also awesome. You can set your playlist each night before the shift starts, and the songs are the perfect background pieces for conversation. Every Day is Night and all of the Kira Miki songs were my favorite. Valhalla managed to deliver a unique experience that is exactly what the title says. The wacky characters and nice music made sure that I had a blast mixing drinks and changing lives. I feel like I could conceivably swing around in Spider-Man forever without getting bored. The game does a really good job at laying a foundation to really put you in the shoes of Spider-Man. It wouldn't necessarily be wrong to say that the game has a lot of mechanics from other games in it, and that it really doesn't do that much differently, but I feel like it's all of the details that this game has and the way that they come together that really work in its favor to set it apart for me. For example, the way that the music swells when you hit the apex of one of your swings, or the fact that there are at least two different deliveries for a lot of Spider-Man's dialogue, depending on whether you're having a conversation while you're swinging around, or if you're just standing still, and the sheer amount of nods to the lore and world building that the game contains in the form of all the suits and backpack collectibles were really cool to discover. The combat is pretty entertaining. I would change up the gadgets I used more often than I typically do in a game like this, and some of the unlockable techniques were pretty handy too. However, towards the end of the game it started to feel repetitive, and when it got to just the final batch of like, go through the base and beat up all the bad guys, I was like, nah, I'm alright. My only other complaint is that certain story beats would cause there to be a severe lack of spider manning in certain sections, and I found those parts to be tedious pace breakers rather than something to keep me interested in the characters that were in focus. Those sections aside though, the story that Insomniac delivered was pretty good. Having the game set 8 years into Peter Parker's time as Spider-Man puts the game in a position to drip feed the player info and entice them to go find out more about the world for themselves in a really organic way. I really liked the villain lineup too. It was a nice combination of faces I don't remember seeing too much of, and other, more familiar faces that made me feel like I was watching the animated series from the 90s again. As far as the plot itself goes, I was able to guess a lot of the major story beats, but it's the way that they happened that made it truly interesting to me, which in turn allows the game to take more liberties later on. Overall, Marvel's Spider-Man is a superior gaming experience and does an amazing job of making you feel like Spider-Man, and the story and gameplay and all the finer details come together in a spectacular package. You know, on paper, God of War has a couple of things I'm not too crazy about. For example, I wasn't a fan of how, in previous games, Kratos was just a one-note rageaholic. I'm also not too fond of annoying sidekicks that follow you around the whole game. Thankfully, God of War pulls off the execution of everything it sets out to do with near perfection. The combat is drastically different than the flashier, faster-paced fighting in the previous entries in the series, but I think this game manages to be what it wants to be while also being faithful to the brutality that was in the other games. Also throwing that axe and calling it back is one of the most satisfying things ever. The boss battles are all still epic duels with some sort of mythical creature or a god of some variety, and they're pushed on by the epic music that amplifies all the high energy moments. Outside of the main story, there's a bunch of optional side missions and other challenging bosses peppered throughout a pretty sizable game world. There's also some RPG mechanics sprinkled into the game in the form of changeable armor and runes for your weapons. I didn't give it too much thought, and it felt mostly unnecessary, so I just ignored it. What puts this game above the rest of the entries in the series for me is its story. 
About midway through the game, there was a sequence of about 10 minutes that put a smile on my face and hyped me beyond reason, and I can't really recall any of the previous games doing that. This moment of course happened during the adventure in which Kratos and his son Atreus set off to spread his recently deceased wife's ashes from the top of the highest mountain in the realm, and, you know, along the way they run into several complications. Suck it earlier games, revenge ain't got nothing on family adventure. Seriously, the reason the story works so well is because the way that the two central characters play off of each other. Kratos is no longer a screaming lunatic out for the blood of the gods and anything else that stands in his way. Now he's more subdued and trying to avoid being sucked back into the past that he tried to leave behind. Also, since emoting anything besides anger is still a novel concept for him, it makes being the lone parent of his son another interesting plight. Atreus also has a satisfying arc that manages to have a solid amount of development while still managing to leave more for the inevitable sequel. As far as other characters go, the bosses are interesting enough, and I actually quite like a few of the other recurring characters. I think it's safe to say that God of War has shifted the paradigm of the series, from the main character going from a one-note psycho to a legitimately enjoyable protagonist, or from the games themselves going from a crazy power fantasy to an actually stirring adventure. I welcome this change, and I'm willing to wait through Ragnarok to see where it goes next. A couple of years ago, when I first started playing the Ace Attorney series, I heard about these games not too long after that, and I decided my interest was piqued and I was gonna dodge spoilers like the plague. I ended up playing the 1-2 Reload, and I ended up liking the first game a little more, so that's gonna be the one I talk about. The basic setup, for those of you who may not know, is Danganronpa revolves around Hope's Peak Academy, the school for the best of the best, or ultimates as they're called. Soon after Makoto, the player character, arrives at the school, things are revealed to not be what they seem. Makoto passes out, and when he wakes up, he stumbles upon the rest of his classmates who also just zonked out upon arrival. Soon after that, a black and white bear shows up. His name is Monokuma, and he tells the students that they are stuck at Hope's Peak Academy and are being forced to play what he refers to as the killing game. The rules of which are try and kill someone and get away with it. After the murder, the rest of the students have to figure out who committed the crime. If they choose the culprit correctly, the killer is punished. If they choose the wrong culprit, everyone but the killer is punished. From there on, the game falls into this nice pattern of downtime and exploration of the school, Monokuma trying to entice someone to kill, the eventual murder, and then the investigation and subsequent trial. The game does a good job at drip-feeding you details about the grander mystery at play, while also balancing solid character interactions and the more immediate problem of the murders that are actually happening in the moment. The class trials in this game are also really tense affairs. I went into almost every one of them thinking I had a pretty good idea of how things were going to shake out, only for my expectations to be tossed around like they were Sebastian Castellanos from The Evil Within. The timer and punishments for wrong answers and other screw-ups were also a nice touch. They would never really put me in danger of game overing, but its looming presence would always put me on edge more than, say, giving an answer in something like Ace Attorney. So what is a murder mystery with a huge cast if we don't have some interesting characters to watch die? My favorites were Mondo, the ultimate biker gang leader. Sakura, the ultimate martial artist, and Kyoko, the ultimate enigma. There's also a handful of other characters, and I only really recall disliking one or two of them. Not to mention Monokuma, who is the undisputed star of the game. He's just so good at being wacky and evil, it's hard not to love. At the end of the day, the combination of secrets of the school, the pure curiosity of who would be next to die, and some pretty interesting characters made my time with Danganronpa one that was so endearingly weird that I won't be forgetting about it for a while. From the ashes of the frustrating disappointment that was Valkyria Revolution rises the phoenix that is Valkyria Chronicles 4. Valkyria Chronicles 4 takes place around the same time as the first Valkyria Chronicles, but it focuses on the Atlantic Federation's campaign of the war and Squad E's struggles throughout the winter. Gameplay-wise, this game sports a couple of welcome additions from the first game, such as a new class, the Grenadier, which has explosive capabilities similar to a Lancer, but it has way better range. They are also a pain in the neck when they're on the other side though, so double-edged sword. Another welcome addition to the gameplay was being able to use your higher ranked soldiers to get some of your other teammates to follow your lead for a group attack. It made moving people easier and it really helped me get around the mobility issues of some classes like Lancers or Grenadiers. 
My one complaint is that there are a lot of boss fights, and a lot of them are repeats with just a slightly different twist to them. Story-wise and tonally, this game is like the antithesis to the first Valkyria Chronicles in a lot of ways. While the first game seemed to have a more hopeful outlook and tone, that made judicious use of its heavy moments. This game prefers to kick you in the teeth and the only respite you get is when it's winding up to kick you again. It also reaffirms something that I believe has been briefly touched on in the first game. The Federation sucks almost as bad as the Empire. I really like comparing the games as thematic opposites in this way. Character-wise, while I didn't love Squad E as much as I loved Squad 7, I still really enjoyed them. Claude quickly gets established as a solid leader whose arc deals with him struggling between his responsibilities to the mission and his personal feelings of what's right. Riley is an estranged childhood friend of Claude's who resents him for something that happened when they were kids. Kai is the stoic sniper who feels things way more than she lets on. And Raz is the overzealous shock trooper who's always there to give Claude the moral support he needs or set him straight when he starts doubting himself. Each of the main cast all go through a solid arc that all have different effects on each other. My two favorites were Kai and Raz. I really liked their developments and I found them the most interesting when they were playing off with each other. Another really cool detail is that using your other units in your squad eventually nets them their own bonus episodes, which is a pretty cool upgrade from unlocking more of their bio like in the first game. I think it really did a good job of showing me just enough of the squad members to establish their personality and endear me to them. It also encouraged me to switch up my lineup to unlock more of these neat sub-episodes. All in all, my time with Squad E was a bit more depressing than my time with Squad 7, but it isn't an experience I regret, and I definitely can't wait to see Europa again when the time comes for another squad to move out. There are two numbers that I feel summarize my experience with Celeste pretty well. The first one is 2289. That is how many times I died during my playthrough of the game. The amazing thing is that I experienced very little feelings of frustration. Each time I died, I simply went, alright, I almost had it, this is what I have to do. Which brings me to the second number, 4. The four words at the end of the prologue set the tone of the rest of the game perfectly. Those words being, you can do this. In context, those words are being said by the main character, Madeline, to reassure herself. But the greatest thing that Celeste achieves is the synergy between the challenging gameplay and the touching story that's being told. Madeline wants to climb a mountain, and the gameplay is just the right kind of challenging to put you in her shoes. It has the simple and tight controls of something like Super Meat Boy, it has truly excellent level design, and it introduces elements that compound with the fundamentals of the gameplay, from these transparent blocks that you can pass through to bubbles that will shoot off in a certain direction. All of these things that they introduce from chapter to chapter keeps the gameplay from ever feeling like it was too much of the same thing. And there are plenty of collectibles, secrets, and challenge levels to come back to after you've beaten the game. And the story of the game is what made all of these challenges matter to me. Madeline is such an easy character to like, and the baggage that she carries around makes her really easy to sympathize with. When climbing the mountain forces her to confront all of her problems, I very much want her to succeed in everything that she's doing. Along the way, she meets characters with their own issues that tie into Madeline's understanding of her own plight. The way that everything comes together thematically in this game is incredible. Right at the end of the prologue, when things start to pick up, the bridge that Madeline is walking on starts to collapse, and the music, which had been mostly soothing and ambient up to that point, switches to a tune that has a much quicker tempo. Later, when Madeline is making the final climb towards the summit, that tune comes back as a persisting piece of the final level's music. All of the elements in the game mesh together to make a plethora of wonderful moments. The final level in particular is one of the most satisfying and cathartic experiences in any game I've ever played. The simplicity of Celeste and the way that everything goes hand in hand is truly great. The music emphasizes the story beats and complements the gameplay perfectly. The challenging gameplay and rewarding feeling that I felt whenever I overcame one of those challenges made me invested in the story, and the story was one of the most sincere and emotional stories I've seen in a game. Celeste is nothing short of a masterpiece, easily my favorite modern 2D platformer, and quite possibly my favorite 2D platformer ever. Anyway, I think I've babbled on long enough, Celeste is great, and I can't wait to own it physically. Thank you, Limited Run. <laughs>